Today on the bench we have an Ingersoll Rand 2131 half inch drive air impact. The owner asked me to get him a rebuild kit because he said it lacked power. And when I took an initial look at it, I think his assessment was incorrect. In addition to having low power, the owner told me that the selector switches are kind of weird. He says one of them tends to pull out. I don't know if that means it doesn't redirect the air. We're going to test that and find out. But when I took a look at the unit as it is, I noticed this screw here is missing. And that's a very important screw. There's four of them that go through the body into the hammer case. The hammer case and the motor housing here, the body, is separated by a gasket. If all four of those screws aren't in there, you're not going to have a tight bond between these two assemblies. You're going to leak air where the screw is missing down here on this corner and you're going to experience low power. So I don't know if it in fact needs a rebuild kit because the rebuild kits don't include those body screws anyway. They really just consist of rotor vanes, a new gasket to go between the two housings, and a few O-rings and a few other small springs and some other accessories. So we're going to take this all apart to see if that's what this in fact requires or is it just a missing screw. We're going to start with taking off the body screws. There's four of them. Usually the ones on this unit are a T15. I've never disassembled a 2131. I've disassembled plenty of 2235s. This looks judging by the schematic, very similar, but we're going to go slow. We're going to make sure we note the way everything comes apart so that when we put it back together again, we're not confused. I use a power driver for the screws back here. It's not necessary. You can do them by hand. In fact, you probably should, but this is a very controllable power driver because it has a, a power setting on it where it relieves the clutch. Once you remove the four screws, the hammer housing and the rotor housing are going to separate. Note that gasket that's in there. When you pull this apart, keep the unit on a horizontal surface like your workbench because if you tip it and hold it on end like this or like that and you pull this apart, the rotor assembly is going to fall out or the hammer assembly is going to fall out. So keep it horizontal like this and gently pull the two different sections apart. And the hammer housing here just pulls off of its mating surface with the rotor housing. It's easiest if for now you just keep it in the hammer housing. And here's your gasket. And so far this looks exactly like a 2235. So I'm going to take all my parts as they come apart and I just put them in a box here off to the side. The rotor housing just drops out of the body and it has a selector switch on the back as well as a plate here. The plate just pulls off and reveals the rotor. The rotor has a spline drive on it and you can see the veins in the rotor and that's what drives this when the air gets cycled through the rotor housing and spins the motor. In the front of the plate here is a sealed bearing that usually doesn't come out without doing some work. We're going to leave it in there. If it pops out, we'll, we'll clean it independently. But in the meantime, we can at least check its function because these bearings are included in a rebuild kit, but they're sealed and unless they're worn out, they don't need to be replaced. This one looks like it's in very good condition. It's nice and smooth. It doesn't make any funny sounds. Next is to pull the selector switch off the back. That just pops off. Sometimes it's easier to use a pair of pliers, like I have to do. Just grab it and pull. And there's another bearing in back here. And the rotor is held in the assembly with a snap ring, so you'll need a pair of external snap ring pliers to pull that off. These are the Lang snap ring pliers. You can uh, just these to be either internal or external.
And the snap ring has some pretty tiny holes in it, so you have to make sure you have the appropriate size tips on the pair of pliers that you're using. The tips on these are the 38 thousandths of an inch tips, and they fit in there just fine. And carefully lift that out. Once the snap rings out, the rotor just falls out of its housing. And then the veins that are in the rotor will also fall out easily. And on this particular model, there's six rotor veins. Some models have seven. Next we pull the selectors out. They're held in with little tabs that face the center line there. To pull those out, the easiest thing to do is just take a pocket screwdriver insert it down in here push that way to release the tab and it just pops out. And then to pop the other one up, you have to reach in there and push on push on the valve that's in there and then it will pop out the other selector. Because these are these are connected with little gear. So same thing there, just put your pocket screwdriver in, press in and that'll fall out, and that will release your selectors and I'm going to give these a quick inspection because the owner said that they weren't they were pulling out he said of that of the selector valve I don't see any damage on them it seems like the plastic is intact I'm, I'm leaving all this stuff out for now because I want to go over this stuff with you specifically because this is very interesting to me from the stuff I'm seeing already next we're going to remove the throttle body and that's this whole assembly that goes up into the handle here there is a tab there and on the opposite side of the handle another tab those need to be depressed so that we can pull this whole assembly out they do make a special tool to do that i just discovered that when i was looking at the schematic on this one i just use my pocket screwdriver i push them in as far as i can and i angle it to force the tab down and it'll get held up momentarily on the inside of the handle, and that'll be enough to release it. And you need something to give it a good to get good to get a good hold on the on the rest of it to pull it out. And sometimes I don't push the tab down as far as I need and it snaps back into place and locks it again. There it is. Sometimes that comes out much more... <laughs> Sometimes it's more difficult to get out than that. That was pretty easy. So here's the entire throttle valve assembly. You have your air inlet here, and it goes up into the body. And the, the throttle valve is this pin right on the top. And the trigger hooks onto the pin, which is really the throttle valve, and it moves the valve out of the way to allow air to flow. And the tabs we were getting out of the way that lock into the handle are this little piece right here. This just pushes out. And that's just the clip that holds the entire assembly. So when we were pushing down, and it was in the handle, it's in there like that. I'm pushing down on this side of the tab and forcing it down that way. And then when the gun gets turned over, same thing on this side. I'm pushing down on this side of the tab and forcing it down that way. And then the whole thing pulls out. In here is the valve 
a little difficult to see because it's in shadow. But there's the valve right there that the selectors on the back turn, and that dictates which side of the rotor the air flows to determine its direction. That just pushes... Oh, the trigger's in the way. <laughs> Pull the trigger out, and then that valve just pulls down and you can knock it out. There are some gaskets back here. They look like they're in very good shape. I'll check them out a little closer anyway. And that's it for the body. The hammer housing houses the hammer assembly, which is the two hammers, the hammer cage, a couple of pins, and the anvil. That just drops easily out of the housing. And this comes apart very simply. Just pull the anvil out of the assembly. You have to twist it and turn it. Those two pins, if you just hold this thing upright, the two pins should easily drop out. Sometimes I need a little help if there's lubricant down there. So we'll just push them out from the top using a pocket screwdriver. That comes out and that comes out. And then turn the cage onto its side, pull it up and there are the two hammers. All right, let's go over everything that I've seen in disassembling this. We'll see if we can correctly figure out what's wrong and then we'll clean it entirely. Order some parts, wait for those to come in, and go from there. First thing I notice is everything looks to be like it's in good shape. Nothing is broken. Nothing looks worn. The inside of the, of the rotor housing looks good. The outside looks fine. For the age, I would expect it to see a little more beat up, but it looks like it's in pretty good shape. The throttle body also looks like it's in good shape. It's extremely dark here, and if I touch that, there's a texture to that. And if I if I try to scratch it a little bit, it's I can you can start to see I'm, I'm removing some stuff. There's a large buildup of looks like old lubricant on there, and also here, and it looks burnt for some reason. I mean, it doesn't it smells kind of funny? It it's going to have to be thoroughly cleaned, but it does not look damaged at all. The rotor, this is the heart of the whole thing here. It looks very similar to the throttle body. There's a lot of buildup on this, and if you scratch through that, you'll get down to bare metal. There we are on the rotor. This is a thick coating of lubricant. And you can see how dark it is. It's burned. What I suspect was happening was whatever lubricant that was in here was never replaced because no one ever disassembled this, which is typical. People don't generally take apart their air tools to do any kind of PM on them. Usually they just keep adding lubricant. You add oil to the rotor and you add grease to the hammer assembly. It looks like nothing has been added over time because... That is burnt. You generally don't see it that dark, but this is. So this guy gets a lot of use and no maintenance. So that's a bad combination. What I suspect he was experiencing, he was experiencing low power, was the increased friction with all this lubricant on it, and it's all burnt and crusty, isn't going to spin freely inside the rotor housing. So... I'm guessing that is one reason why he's getting a low performance. The other is, when we look at the veins, we see the same kind of thing. There's burnt lubricant all over the veins. They do not look worn. They do not look broken. But again, these have to slide in and out of the slots in that rotor housing. So a buildup of lubricant that has never been changed, A, it loses its lubricating properties, and B, it has the opposite effect and increases friction. So these are going to have to be cleaned too, because if you scratch through the crap that's on there, you can start to see the original color beneath. 
I'm going to sound like a broken record when I say the same thing about the hammer assembly. Old lubricant. It's burned. It's very thin what remains. There's no useful lubricant on here. And you can see on the outside of the hammer cage, if you scratch through that, same kind of thing. You can see the original metal underneath, but there's a heavy buildup of old lubricant, which no longer does what it's supposed to do, and you can feel a grittiness to it. There is a Zerk in, in the hammer housings on these. What some people do who care enough to actually lubricate these is they'll get a grease gun and they'll squirt some grease in there from time to time. That's terrific. It adds new lubrication, just like you need. However, unless you're taking this apart regularly and cleaning out all the old lubricant, all you get is a buildup of crap, which is what we see here when we look inside of the hammer housing. Might be tough to see because it's in shadow. But down along here, you can see there's a heavy buildup of old grease that has lost all its lubricity and it's just tar right now. The question that he had about the selector and the valve. Let's take a look to see if there's any damage there. I'm looking at the teeth in the valve that mate with the teeth in the selector. And this, they work in conjunction. When you push one, it rotates the valve. When you push the other, it rotates it the other way. I already looked at the teeth on the selector and they look good. I'm looking at the teeth on the valve and they also look pretty good. But what I do see on here is a buildup of more stuff. So when we look at the gunk that's built up here, is it possible that there's such a buildup that it's kicking off the teeth from the gears of the selector and this isn't working? That's absolutely possible. I would say probable, as a matter of fact, because everything else looks to be good. There are some delicate pieces to this valve in here. There's some plastic connector pieces that can break over time, but those are all intact and it appears to be good. The trigger itself is not, there's not much to it. It's really just a stem with a hook and that hook there is what grabs onto the throttle valve. And as you push the switch, it actuates the valve. There's an O-ring here and that's intact. That looks fine. The anvil looks perfectly intact, albeit covered with old nasty lubricant. The two hammers look perfectly good, but like everything else in the hammer housing, covered with old gross lubricant. It seems the best thing to do now is just to clean the snot out of it, get it all down to bare material, get a replacement screw, re-lubricate it, reassemble it, run some air through it, and I'm going to bet we'll find that this thing performs as good as new. Thoroughly cleaning these tools is critical because doing so allows you to uncover any hidden damage. This bearing was covered in grease, so I didn't see the fact that someone had previously had this out and tried to put it back in and they used a punch. You can see there's four indentations there. They're trying to hammer this thing back in. And when you turn it, it's extremely rough. It gets caught up in a couple of places and it doesn't turn smoothly and that bearing is crucial to the efficiency of the motor. So that's got to get replaced too. The challenge that I have is getting the thing out because it's flush in there and there's no, there's nothing to grab onto. You can see that there's a gap. Well, I don't know if it's a gap so much right there. Oh, it's so hard to see where the 
bearing rests on the shoulder and you can there isn't there, there's hardly any space there at all uh, there's nothing to grab onto to pull this thing out of here and it's a very tight press fit i'll use some heat to loosen it up but then the question becomes what i'll use to grab that with or push it out with and the answer is i have no idea so i have to do to do a little experimenting to find out after waiting a few weeks for some parts to come off a of back order i think they all came in got a bag of parts here let's check it against the work order slip that I made up just to make sure we got everything. We need body screw, check. Rotor vane set, check. Two rotor bearings, that's those guys. Those are the ones that were on back order. Selector switches, check. That's the button kit and a valve, <clears throat> excuse me, a valve assembly. Check. And the gasket. Everything is here. Let's start putting it all back together again. This gasket slides in the rear of the, the housing. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a slot here. And that accepts this piece of the gasket. And there's some grooves on here that slide over a couple little rails here it's kind of tough to show you while i do it because it's gotta it's gotta get lined up right but once it's lined up it slides right in Next, we will put the valve assembly back in the handle, and the first thing to go in there is the new valve that sits at the top of the handle, the bottom of the body, and this is what directs the airflow to a particular side of the rotor to determine whether it goes forward or reverse. And as we do this, we're going to lubricate the o-ring so I'm going to be putting some grease on these as we go. This half moon shape goes toward the front of the body so it'll go in on this orientation and we have to insert it up through the handle. So once the valve is up and seated properly it's kind of tough because it's easy to push it down too far, and it's easy to push it up too far. So you kind of kind of hit this happy middle ground there. We can finagle with it once I get everything else set in there, but that's good enough for now because now we got to put the selector buttons in place. With the valve seated properly, the buttons just press in, and these can only go one way. The teeth have to go toward the center line of the tool and the shape of the button has to match the recess for it. So this one will go in this side and then the other one goes in the opposite side. And they should just press in nice and then when you press them they'll engage the teeth on the valve and when they do you can see it turns it like it should and then we just press on the other side. And when they go in, when you press them, you can see it turn the valve there but it looks like I got the valve misaligned a little bit when 
when these are in a neutral position like they are now that half moon cutout should be centered and it's not as off to the side so I'll just have to remove them and line that up again so pop the buttons back out the same way we did originally pocket screwdriver is ideal for this just stick it down in there and then press it to pry the little tab loose and the buttons come out in theory Now that those are both out, we got to align this valve better. So now that I've got it at 45 degrees, I'm going to put in the button on the one side that will go in all the way, and that should keep it aligned. more like it. Now you can see how it goes to 45 degrees on either side of center and the buttons pop out all the way. Forgive the dog. She hears fleas farting a mile away and she's got to bark at it. She's got to bark at everything. So now we'll put the valve assembly and the, the rather the throttle valve assembly back in. And that includes a trigger. And the way this goes in is there's no there's no left or right, it's just this goes in toward the toward the body and this sticks out of the bottom of the handle. The only thing this needs is a retainer clip that will keep it in place. Just snaps on. Put a little grease on the trigger. And the way this goes is uh, when the trigger stem goes in through that hole in the bottom there. Like that. And then there's a little hook on the back end of the trigger. That's going to catch the stem on the throttle valve. See how that's going to go? So when you push the trigger in, it's going to actuate the valve like that and you can put the trigger in first and insert this up in through but I think you can also put this in and then just push the trigger in and it should press past the throttle valve I've never done it that way I've always put the trigger in first and just fed this up and through it's always worked pretty well for me um, but I, I, I read a comment on one of my other repair videos that somebody said you could put the throttle valve assembly in first and then just press the trigger in to hook around 
the stem. Either one, I guess, would work. I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it. But all right, this is the way I'm used to doing it, and I know it works well. So you put the trigger in, and you don't put it in far because you have to make sure that ah, you can't see it. You have to make sure that that stem isn't in so far that you're going to press it past the, the throttle valve. And I'll put a little bit of lube on the O-ring here. And this should be a pretty simple matter of sliding this in and making sure you line up the ears on the retainer clip with the cutouts in the handle, otherwise it's not going to go in. So there's only one way to really do it. That just slides up and it should just lock into place. Now if I did it right, this trigger is going to press it and spring back and I can't pull it out. So I know that the throttle valve is in the correct position relative to that trigger. So you just like that. Next we'll put the rotor assembly together. I don't normally like to put a lot of jump cuts in my videos, but man, I'm just disorganized today and I don't have everything together where I need it. so. I'm just running back and forth gathering my tools, so forgive the jump cuts, please. Both of the rotor bearings are the same. One is for the front, one is for the back, so it doesn't matter which one you use where. The one in the rear goes in the back of the housing, and there's a recess for it there. And you have to be very careful, because these are press fit. So it's not going to slide in real smooth. You might have to use a little, a little um, force to get it down in there. Do not hit this with a punch because that's what the last guy did and it got dented all in there. And when you do that, you've just ruined the integrity of the bearing and you defeated its purpose. So when this goes in, you can try um, using some heat, which would probably be the best way to do it so that you're not pounding it in. And if you did want to pound it in, it, it, I, I, I can't recommend doing that. But if you were to, there's a ring right here. Uh, there we go. We're in focus now. Try to get a socket or something that fits that ring. Do not press on this portion here because that's if you dent this portion, that's when you're going to wreck the bearings. So I, I can't recommend pounding it in. I do recommend using some heat, which we'll do. We're going to heat up the, the body here, and this will slip right in. It doesn't take much heat. And we're just going to go around. That's like burn myself. Just go around the recess where we're going to be putting this in. Just enough to expand it a little bit. And that bearing will slide right in. Now it's going to be hot, so I don't want to touch it, but this will slip right in there. There you go. And it has to go flush, so make sure that when you do that, the outer surface of the bearing sits flush with the motor housing. Now we take the rotor and this is the front with the spline drive. This is the rear that has the groove for the snap ring that retains it. So this is going to be dropped in 
with this portion going toward the rear of the housing like that. Can I touch it yet? It's still kind of warm. Because we have to put a snap ring on the back there that, re that sets into that recess around the spindle on the rotor. So with a pair of snap ring pliers that have tips that are the right size, mm-hmm, 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 focus, we spread the snap ring, and just set it right in place. Always make sure when you put a snap ring in that you press on it to make sure it has seated properly in the slot. Because you don't want to, you don't want to be kind of sure that it's in the right place. You got to be absolutely sure, because once everything else goes back together again, if that snap ring isn't seated right, it's gonna pop out later on down the line, and you have to disassemble everything just to get back, to get it back together again. So an ounce of prevention here is worth a pound of cure. So just make sure that you can manipulate that snap ring that it's that it slides around and doesn't pop out. Press down on it to make sure it's snapped into its groove there. And this one seems to be exactly as we want it. Next, we take the selector switch. This is a speed control switch. This tab here is going to go into this slot on the top. See there's three slots. It's going to go in the center widest one. And there's an O-ring on here so we're going to use a little bit of grease. And this just presses in. Like that. Now it's going to get retained and they're better uh, by the by the housing. And I'll show you how that looks once we get that in there. But once you've got it in the right space place, you can feel that there's uh, these detents for it. That way you know you got it correct. Now we insert the rotor housing into the body and the, and the speed switch is going to go toward the rear. And if everything works right, then all the slots in the bottom of the rotor housing are going to clear all the pieces in the bottom of the body and it'll slide right back. And you can tell it's back far enough when the speed switch is flush with the outer surface of the body. Make sure it's back far enough. You got to give it an extra oomph sometimes just to make sure it's back there um, because sometimes it gets held up a little bit. But that feels like it's back as far as it's going to go. And what's really going to tell is once we get further along in the assembly. If this spindle is sticking too far out, nothing else will work. So you know that your rotor housing didn't go back far enough. But right now this seems like it's fine. Next, the veins have to go in the rotor. These have to be oriented so that this long flat surface here, and you can see as opposed to this 
angled surface here, the long flat surface is going to go against the inside of the housing here. So when these are inserted, make sure that A, that long flat edge is facing toward the inside surface here and the square notch is facing toward the front. Now before we do that, a little bit of oil is going to go a long way. I just like to put one drop in each of the vein slots. You want to make sure that there's enough lubrication that the veins slide easily in and out of their respective slots, but not so much that you build up surface tension and these don't slide out. So these just insert. I did it upside down. That's awesome because that's how I roll. Okay, remember what I told you? Don't do what I just did. <sighs> Long surface toward the inside. Square notch toward the front. It's not difficult. And there they all are, and you can spin this around and check how loose the veins are. Make sure that when you do that, you can hear and see them slide out of their slots toward the, the inner surface here. And that's exactly what you want. Perfect. Next, we're going to put the end cap on, and the cap goes over the spindle here. And you have to have it all aligned. I'll show you that in a second. But what you have to do is you have to put the front rotor bearing into the recess here. Now, we can't heat this up because the end cap is made out of plastic. So we're going to have to press this in. Even though I recommend not doing it that way, sometimes it is the best way to do it. You just have to be really careful. I use an 11 millimeter socket and that fit over that inner ring perfectly. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, I don't have a press. Would have made it much easier if I did. But tapping it in gently and check it frequently because it's going to be a little cockeyed in there. So you might have to put more pressure on one side until you even it out and then more on the other until you work it in there. Ideally, you want to press it in all at once, but that's not necessarily the most practical thing given, given the limitations of, of the design. So just be careful and check it to make sure that it works right. It does. I didn't screw it up. All right. So now this goes over our rotor spindle. Make sure when you put the cap back on that these half circles here line up with the slots here for the body screws. Two of these are closer than the others, so just make sure that you get it correct and drop that on and just check those holes to make sure they line up. I got this one wrong. Alright, so pop it back off and do it again. All right, now you can see they're correct. When these half circles line up with these slots, that's when you got it right. 
and I mean they're gonna be you can see they're off by a little bit but once the screws go in then this will this will wiggle around a little bit and everything will drop into place the body assembly is done now we do the nose and hammer assembly there's your nose cone here's your hammer cage the anvil the two hammers and the two hammer pins Make sure when you lubricate this, you put grease on the anvil where the dogs are. This is a dog, this is another dog, and that's what the hammers strike against to impact on the anvil and turn the anvil. So put plenty of grease on there. When, when someone is using this, there's a, a grease zerk on the cone to lubricate the inside of this. So put some grease on the inside surface as well as, as the hammers and the nose piece. So the first thing to do is put the hammers in the hammer cage and they have to be oriented a certain way. If you look at the cut out there, it looks like a little ghost with his hands up in the air. One ghost goes with his hands up and the other ghost goes the other way with his hands down. And these guys stack on top of each other. And then they go in the cage that way. So through the opening of the cage, I slide in the hammers. One facing one way, the other facing the other. And there's slots on the side. They're going to line up with the pins. Just drop the pins in. One usually goes in pretty smooth. And then the other, you have to mess around a little bit and then that pin drops in. Now make sure that once the pins are in, if you pick this up this way, then the pins are just gonna fall out underneath. So turn this sideways so that it doesn't fall apart. Now we're gonna grease the anvil where the dogs are. And then this just slides in the recess there, and you're going to have to kind of wang jang a little bit to, to get it all lined up and get it past, get those dogs fed in past the recesses on the hammers, and then it just sits, it just sits in there once you're done. But be careful because this can fall out. It will lock in to some degree, but again, if you move it, it'll fall out. So just be careful of this assembly the way it is. And then the nose here. He's going to get some uh, some grease because we're going to grease up the surfaces of the hammers. And this whole assembly just inserts like that. Now again, make sure you don't turn this that way because everything's going to fall out. So we're going to keep that on its side. There's a gasket that goes between the hammer assembly and the body. And there is a particular orientation to this as well. Am I lying to you about that? They're used to... Well, I know in some models there is, apparently not on this one. This is probably an old, old enough model that they changed the design. So on some models, there's a little tab on the gasket here, and there is a recess on the other models somewhere on this housing to show you how to orientate it properly, but that's not the case with this. If you can see, there's no, there's no little recess on the inside of this to accept that tab. Okay, that's a new one on me, so. The only thing to be sure of then is that, like with the end cap, these half-circled holes line up with the screw holes. 
and there's a flat surface and then there's a contoured surface, make sure the flat surface goes against the inside of the hammer housing. And you know that's correct when your holes line up. Very carefully make these two pieces together. And like everything else, be sure that the holes in the hammer assembly line up with the holes in your housing. Now, the proof here is going to be whether or not all the body screws line up properly the way they should and go into the respective holes. I do not recommend doing this, but I do it. <laughs> um, don't use a power tool for this, but I have this adjustable driver so I can set a clutch to the lowest setting so I don't over torque something. I do it just to make sure I can get the screw in first, that screw fits. If I can get an opposite screw in, then I know I'm all lined up. Okay, and that fits too. So I'm going to take these back out. Because I want to put some Loctite on the threads. Blue Loctite, do not use any other color because we don't want this to be permanent. We want just a dab in there to hold everything and keep it from backing out. And when you put these in, there's a method for tightening them that I want you to take note of. Notice how I did not tighten that. There's still a gap in the front here that is not drawn tight. I do not want that yet. Same thing. I do not tighten them yet. Okay, now that the screws are in, now I'm going to start my tightening sequence. And the reason this is important is because of this red gasket here. Anytime you're mating two surfaces that have a gasket between them, you want to make sure that you, that you tighten them as evenly as possible so that you don't go in crooked and then pinch the gasket and then maybe have a gap in the other side. So anytime you're mating two surfaces of anything that have a gasket, whether it's an air tool or anything else, Go very carefully when you tighten. I set my driver on the lowest setting so that I don't over torque it. And I go until it's tight. And then I go diagonally opposite. I don't go in like a round robin sequence because this is going to pull it more evenly. Now that all four of those have had their initial tightening, I'm going to adjust my clutch on here and tighten them a little bit more. Now that they've had a second one, we go a little bit more. And that sound you hear is not me stripping screws that's the clutch in here letting off so that i don't over tighten something that's the difference between this driver and an impact 
They sound similar, but an impact will keep hammering. This does not, this lets off. So that's why I use this because I, I can set the, the let off on this so I don't break something. All right, now we're all back together again. Let's go to the garage, hook this up to the compressor and give it a test. Street light people leaving us to find motion shadows searching in the night. All right, let's hook this guy up and see if it works. Pretty confident. <coughs> Seems pretty good. That's reverse. This is forward. <coughs> I'd say it's a success. So we'll package this up, write up the work order for the customer, and we're going to deliver it on Tuesday. Well, relative to when this video airs, I don't know. But <laughs> by the time you see this, you will have long since had this. Um, and I, I like it when they're this easy to take apart and put back together again. No surprises. Everything was pretty smooth. It was easy to tell what the original problem was, which makes it very easy to fix. And I like those because I get confused easily on this stuff. And uh, I like it when a plan comes together. So do me a favor, keep watching the channel because we've got a ton of different and new kinds of videos coming out, including some more live streams. We're going to tackle some very interesting topics, including tools made in the USA and what US-based manufacturing is like. Also, we're going to have lots of tools in the haul segments, as well as more air tool repair videos. So do me a favor and click down here now to subscribe so that you don't miss any of it. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, use a tool. Don't be one. <laughs>